Hello and welcome to this week's reading vlog. I read a total of this many books. So this week was the week that I read all of the books library thing recommended to me and I tried to pick one from each category to make it a little more interesting and to see if it got my tastes in those particular categories. I also, if I've had time, added some YA sci-fi and other YA horror and other YA categories. I don't know if I'm going to get to them or not this week, depends how much I can read this week. But without much further ado, let's see how accurate library thing was at knowing what I like. So here we go. This is the recommendations page. So you can just scroll on here and add books that they recommend, but you can also do it by category. So I'm just going to go through some of the categories and pick some of like just whatever the first ones are that they recommend. And um, yeah, we'll see how we go with their recommendations. Hello, every time I start filming, <laughs> this little munchkin comes running in, don't you darling? Every time, every time. So I am going to be reading, as I've already said, the books that library thing recommended. I'm going to start with the library books that have come in because they have to go back. So I'm going to read those ones first. So, so far I've got here, we've got Pandora by Susan Stokes Chapman. And it says some doors are kept locked for a reason. So I think this one is historical, if I'm correct, because it is set in London, 1799. So, oh, there's so much glare on that. <laughs> is it there? Is that, that's good. Um, so I will be starting probably with this book. It's quite hefty, but we'll see how we go. I love the name already, Pandora. Like. I actually almost called one of my cats Pandora. It was on the list. And then we've got House of Hunger by Alexis Henderson. This is definitely a different cover than I've seen online. I think I prefer the one with the woman, personally, because I, I'm here for a hot chick. But this is, I think, in the horror category. I assume it's to do with vampires, but I'm also excited to read this one. So those are probably some of the first ones that I will be picking up to read. Hello, so I just finished reading House of Hunger by Alexis Henderson. I believe this is horror, classified as horror. And it's about a woman named Marion. And in this world, there are these houses. And these houses employ young women to be their blood maidens. Now, it's believed that the blood of young women bestows youth and cures maladies. So Marion decides to become one of these blood maidens and there's something sinister going on. Not all is as it seems. It is sapphic, but I did not like the romance. It was very toxic and there was a huge power dynamic in play. So it definitely wasn't for me on a romance level. That being said, it was very easy to read. I did give it three stars and I was oscillating between three and three and a half. But in the end, I've decided to go with three because I didn't really, really enjoy it. I enjoyed it, but it was okay. The writing's easy to get into. It's easy to read. It's quite gory. There's a lot of blood play, obviously, at hand. Um, there are horror elements. There is violence and death. There's also a found family aspect, although that really wasn't delved into. Marion pretty much is the main character and all of the other characters are secondary. There's not many that I enjoyed. I like the cat. <laughs> I think cats are always going to be my favorite characters in books. Um, I still read it to the end. I wanted to sort of to know what really was going on. It's still a little ambiguous as to what the supernatural element in this is. Um, I can't say more than that without giving it away, but I did enjoy my time with it. And for a horror book, I did enjoy it. Horror generally is not my genre at all. The only horror book I've ever enjoyed is Juniper and Thorn, but I wanted to try a suggestion from every genre. And for a horror book, I kind of liked it. There is a sort of fantasy element because it's sort of about blood sucking, vampires, that kind of thing. Are they vampires or are they not vampires though? So that's discovered in the book because I thought, I'm like, are they vampires? <laughs> mm, who knows? Um, but yeah, look, I did enjoy it, but I, yeah, I'm going to settle on a three. I like, part of me feels like I should rate it three and a half because I did finish it very quickly. I wanted, and I'm like, that's great. I love books that 
I can read through very quickly, but I'm going to stick with three because yeah, a three and a half, I might be tempted to pick up again in the future, whereas a three I won't and I won't want to read, read this. So that was House of Hunger. The next book I am going to read is Pandora. I've taken that with me. I'm actually going away on a one night stay at a winery. It was meant to be for my three year anniversary with my now ex-partner, but we've just decided to go as friends anyway, because we both need a break. And the sound of a beautiful degustation lunch and a night away from home, away from responsibilities, really sounds delightful to me. So I, we are still going and I'm hoping to get a little bit of reading done there, but I don't know. But if I do read, it will be Pandora. So let's have a look. We've got the sauna, in the room sauna. Those are the products. This is the shower and the bathroom in general. And then we've got the bed and the bed looks out onto like this little courtyard slash the winery so that's the bedroom and then in the middle of the room <laughs> is the bath right in the middle and then you've got a drinks trolley uh, the lounge room once again another little courtyard more views of the winery tv area and then the little kitchenette Hello, so I got back from uh, the night away and the place was really lovely, like beautiful, beautiful room. And they had some lovely breads and mueslis and jams for breakfast in the morning. So I thought that was amazing. <laughs> However, they had this automatic air freshener dispenser that was like connected to the ceiling that let off a big of fake fragrance into the room every 30 minutes. So. Not only did that affect my sleep because of the sound of it was so loud, um, the fragrance ended up giving me a headache. I'm a bit sensitive to that. So did not have the best night's sleep. Feeling really glad to be home, to be honest, so I can get some sleep tonight. Sylvie, Sylvie this cat. Um, I did finish reading on my little trip, Pandora by Susan Stokes Chapman, which is about Dora Blake, who's an aspiring jewelry artist whose parents had an antiquities shop. They were de killed in an accident on a dig site and she was taken care of by her uncle. It's multiple POVs. I did not care about the other people's POVs. There was Dora's, there was a dude's, Edward, I think was in his POV, who's a love interest, and her uncle. Uh, her uncle's name is Hezekiah and he's an absolute piece of shit. So in this book, um, she discovers a Greek vase that her uncle had been hiding and there's sort of like a mystery around it. This book I've given it one star. I really do not enjoy it. So I found it boring. It was really slow paced and like I said with the multiple POVs I just found it hard to keep my attention. Um, Dora was a bit sort of naive in terms of how she just expected people to take on her jewelry designs and I felt like well <laughs> you've got no like clientele, you've got no, these are just drawings. Um, so I found that a bit unrealistic. In terms of like the antiquity store, her uncle was running everything and he's a dodgy, skeezy man. Dora is aware of this, but also wasn't trying to do anything to sort of unseat him and to save her parents' shop from his clutches. The Greek element was called cool. someone with a Greek background. I did like reading about that and reading the Greek words. It's like, oh, I know what that means. Um, the vase itself, so would I say this has a fantastical element to it? I guess uh, it's got a tiny smidge of magical realism in, in that. Is this vase cursed or is it not? But there was really the whole mystery of the vase and what happened to her parents and all that sort of thing wasn't that great. Like it really wasn't that. I did read it to the end because I just wanted to know, does this get better? The point where it absolutely lost me 
and got plummeted to a one star was this does include a trigger warning. This does include um, the murder of animals. And that's one thing that I just don't like to read about in books. I can't, I just, I, it really upsets me, even if it's a fictional animal in a movie, in a book. As soon as that happens, I'm completely taken out of the story and that's all I focus on. It just makes me feel wretched and I cannot get back into things. So you kill an animal and I'm like, screw you, man. Like, I can't, I can't. I did continue reading it because it was so close to the end, but that really soured my overall opinion. Like I said, the writing's not amazing. The characters, I don't really care for them. I guess Dora was the best character, but even her, I found a bit petulant and annoying. The story itself was so meandering, it was so slow, there were just way too many people's point of views in this. It didn't need it, didn't really add a lot to it, you could have just done it with one. The mystery that was solved was just so just like, yep, okay, I could have called that. Like, that was very obvious, it wasn't this mind-blowing thing, it didn't feel cathartic wrapping it up. I was just like, yeah, and like... <sighs> So for me, this was a big fail. Um, I think to look just in general, historical books, they have to either have a really fantastical element to it or historical romance tends to be more my thing. Books that are historical just for the sake of being historical haven't necessarily turned out well. That being said, like I said, I do like classics. Picture of Dorian Gray is amazing. That does have a fantastical element, though, now that I said that out loud. But look, this was as part of an experiment with library thing. I did just pick one of the first books that was on there. I could have read through the blurbs of all of them to try and pick one that was more likely to be up my alley. But like I said, this one's name was Pandora. I love the name Pandora, almost called my cat that. And it had Greek elements, so I love Greek history. And it seemed to have a bit of a magical element to it. So by all intents and purposes, this one did seem like it would hit the spot for me, but it just didn't. So unfortunately that was Pandora. The next book that I'm going to read is The Fine Print. I thought, let's take a break from the heavier, more serious stuff and read a romance. And I've heard a lot of amazing things about this series. I think it's a billionaire's something or other. <laughs> but we'll see how we go with it. Which shoes do I want? Hello. So I have read quite a few books. Let me tell you about them. First up, we had The Fine Print, which is a romance. So this has made the rounds. I think it's called Dreamland Billionaire Series and it's based on these rich boys that have inherited their Disneyland from their grandfather, but each one has a contingent that he must comply with in order to get his inheritance. So in this first one, forgotten the dude's name already. Yeah, that's the way it goes because I did DNF this. The dude has to implement a new ride, successful ride in six months. Anyway, this book started out, the writing wasn't for me, straight out the gate. I'm like, I don't really like the writing. Then we've got the characters and they were, I didn't like the guy, I didn't like the girl. I hated the girl even more than the guy. So the way they come across, it's just overly dramatic. It felt like a soap opera. And I know these books are not meant to be realistic, but like this was too much for me. I was just like, <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it. The tipping point came when the dude and the chick met. So he's at a meeting. She walks in like 20 minutes late. Straight out the gate, I am one of those annoying people who's always punctual, early even. I don't like tardiness. It really feels disrespectful to my time. So she walks in 20 minutes late, so unprofessional. Not only that, she walks in like she's a one-woman band. She's just causing a ruckus. She's bringing her own sideshow, bumping into people, dropping shit, making noise. Rightly so. He's like, hey... Can you keep it down? We're trying to have a goddamn meeting here. I didn't find that. I don't know if that's meant to be like a charming thing about her, but straight away I was like, bitch, just fucking slink in. Like, what are you doing? So not only that, when she does sit down, she starts giving off snide commentary in the meeting. She starts cussing shit and she's giving her like personal opinion. And I'm just like, woman, you at work. This is a work meeting. Like, where is your professionalism? Do you have no like decorum? I just couldn't believe it. I just looked straight out the gate and like, wow, this is hella rude to be put, to be honest. And rightly so. He's like, uh, dude, like shut the fuck up. Like you can't just be given, you know, insults. So then she starts cussing him out. This is a man. She doesn't know who he is, what his rank is, who he is, but she just starts turning on him and insulting him. 
And at that point, like he starts thinking, I'm gonna fire her. And I'm like, fire this bitch. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I, I would fire her too. I'd be like, hey man, this is not okay. This is not respectable behavior. You are not, you're being really offensive. It's creating a really unsafe environment. You just, look, you got grievances in the workplace. You go through the channels or you pull that person aside if it's a particular person be like hey this thing that you said really didn't didn't resonate with me and it's actually made me feel slighted or whatever it is but you're not sitting there in a meeting just sending out like under your breath insults Ugh, i didn't like it and she, she was just so arrogant and not chill like i know having you have might have like personal relationships with some of your co-workers and you want to have a gossip over the water cooler cool but like in a freaking meeting maybe you like just zip it and save your thoughts for the end when they said does anyone have any feedback they want to give speak up but just oh i couldn't stand it. i'm like oh i don't like this this character whatsoever i didn't like him to begin with but her she was even worse so i had to dnf that dnf that then we've got the next category which was fantasy and it was a book of Azrael. I think this might be considered dark fantasy. So I'm not even going to get into the plot. For me, this was a very fast DNF because there was a scene where the woman was pretty much sexually assaulted by her lover. That's not for me. I don't care that he's like, oh, this is someone I've had sex with. If she doesn't want him touching her, he just goes and starts touching her genital area and she's like, leave me alone, let me go. I don't want to be indebted to you. And he's like, no, you belong to me. That's not for me. It's just not my cup of tea. I don't like it. I won't read about it. So I had to DNF that book very, very quickly. The next book I picked up was Hello Pretty Lady. The next book that I picked up was Not the Witch You Wed. It's fantasy romance as the category. And with this one, you've got three triplets. They're witches, one of whom doesn't really have her powers. And there's an alpha wolf with whom she has history. Some shit went down when they were teenagers. She was slighted. She is now very much in the I hate you camp. They meet again as adults and sparks fly much to her chagrin. For me, the writing in this was not great. And this book was just overly cheesy. Now, I know these things are not meant to be believable, but when you have a book that has just cheesy over the top dialogue where it's just trying to be banter and one liners constantly, I just really, it grates on me. I don't like that kind of writing. I don't like that kind of dialogue. It just makes me feel like the whole thing is very superficial and there's no depth to the characters. And the whole reason for their conflict, it was one of those frustrating tropes that I don't like where it's, you know, I would communicate what happened if I could, but I can't because of this other thing. And I just don't like it. So for me, I had to DNF that one because after Pandora, uh, pushing through just to give that a one star. I was like, we're not going to do this anymore. <laughs> so I have had three DNFs in a row. And let me tell you, I was starting to worry. I'm thinking, library thing, you've done me just as dirty as Goodreads. But then I went to the sci-fi category and sci-fi normally isn't really my, my jam. You know, I, I don't mind it here and there, but most of the time it's a miss rather than a hit. However, after reading this book, which is uh, We Hunt the Stars, which I gave a solid four stars to, I realized that there is a trope in sci-fi that I just eat up, I just devour. And it's the whole female captain with her ragtag crew that are like her family in their absolutely deteriorated old junkyard of a ship get contacted by some hot, broody, alien man dude with dubious uh, motivations to take on some kind of mission. At first, the captain's like, nah, -uh, you sketchy as hell. No, thank you. But then the crew's like, <laughs> woman, our, our, uh, we haven't eaten for days and the ship's about to fall apart. We need the monies. So the captain then goes, okay, I will take on this mission for so many dineros and uh, let's get to it begrudgingly. But along the way, there is a slow burn romance with Captain and a grumpy alien man. And I freaking love it. So in this case, you have Captain Octavia with her crew. Octavia was formerly in the war as a captain and the crew was her squad. And some stuff went down and they decided to part ways with the military and just become sort of paid bounty hunters, treasure hunters, what have you. Then Torrin comes along and he's part of this alien race that they had previously been at war with. So naturally she's like, <laughs> I'm not touching this with a 10 foot pole. 
Of course, uh, Alien Man then offers an exorbitant amount of money that would last them years and years and afford for them to get a massive ship upgrade. So naturally, the crew's like, we got to do this. So begrudgingly, she takes on the mission, which is to reclaim a stolen heirloom that was taken from him. Naturally, there is a slow burn romance. It was delicious. This dude was very heavily into consent, which is just what I like. It's my foreplay. He's all like, I'd really like to kiss you. Can I? I'd like to do this to you. Will you let me? And I'm like, yes, if you ask permission to board the ship, I will let you enter. So I loved it. There were scenes. It is spicy. I wouldn't say it's smutty but it is spicy, but I love it when an author is able to make an intimate scene in a way that I have not read a scene like that before. The setup and what have, I'm like, oh, this is new. So the novelty is exciting and I loved it. If you'll remember from my last vlog, I talked about a book, The Chilling Effect, sci-fi, promised psychic cats on the cover, promised it, did not deliver. This book has a psychic cat-like creature and I loved it. It's what I wanted in that other book. This cat mostly, I say cat, but she ain't a cat. Her name's Luna. Broadcasts pictures of empty food bowls <laughs> into Octavia's mind like, girl, I'm hungry. Give me some food. And I loved that cat, psychic cat creature. I was like, yes, I love you. And naturally, the broody alien man has just an instant reverence and honors this cat-like creature and bonds with it. And I'm like, oh and likes kitties. I can't help but like a cat daddy. So I love this story. Naturally, there were there were double crossings. There were other layers involved in this heirloom that was stolen and things were revealed. So the, the book also had enough plot to keep me interested. But I'm going to be honest, I was here for the romance. I, I, had to, I went in this to this thinking it's going to be the plot for me, but the romance stole the show. And I ain't mad about it. I ate it up. So thank the Lord for We Hunt the Stars because otherwise I probably would have been hella depressed <laughs> and not wanting to even tackle the other books. That being said, the next book that I'm going to be reading is the graphic novel, which is called Over My Dead Body. So it is meant to be delivered today. I did have to purchase this. It wasn't in any of the libraries around me and I cannot read um, graphic novels on e-readers. So I bit the bullet, I purchased the book. Hopefully it pays off. You know, it's a bit of a gamble. I don't really like to buy books as you know, buy two or three a year. So I am rolling the dice with this one, but I don't know. The premise of it sounded interesting enough that I think I might, it might pay off. We will see, we will see. Did I waste my hard earned dollars or did I bring home some gold? Hello, so I just finished Over My Dead Body by Sweeney Boo. I'll show you the insides of this book. So this is about a group of witches, the main one named Abby. When her friend Noreen goes missing, she tries to find her. So she comes across a lot of, I would say, obstacles in finding her friend. She's just not really trusting the academy that she's at the Institute of Witchcraft, to find her friend. So she sort of enlists help from some of the other students at her in her uh, institute. All of the witches have animal familiars, so they're all they're all different. I won't show you the end, obviously. <laughs> um, so all the animals are different. They all talk to the witches. I really liked it for a graphic novel. I have a different rating system, obviously. Graphic novels, I tend to... <laughs> Have lower expectations than a written novel so with this one i did like the illustration styles i thought it was good i liked the way the characters were drawn at the start of every chapter there was always a quote by edgar Allan poe which i thought was a nice touch um there were different so this one does also include a sapphic romance but it's just a kiss on the lips, so I'd still be fine with my 11-year-old reading this. It's nothing full-on. It's very chaste. Um, there's not, it's not heavy on romantic relationships at all. It's just something that happens at the end after stuff. <laughs> it was the, the plot was interesting, but I do find sometimes with graphic novels, you've just got that lack of pacing. It's they're either too rushed or too slow, and with this one, the pacing was de was decent, but then it wrapped up very, very quickly. <laughs> it just all 
came together at the end. It was like, well, what's going on? What's going on? Investigate, investigate. And then bam, um, mystery kind of solved. And it wasn't exactly solved in the way that I expected it to be solved. It was like, oh, okay. I didn't even know that was an option. I realize now this is not the best angle. Sorry, guys. So I did enjoy it. There was some violence in it. It's a little bit scary. Like, it's not too bad, but it's mostly if you don't want to see um, blood pouring out of someone's eyes. So, like, this is probably the most graphic sort of image in here, um, along with the demon. I'll show you what the demon looks like, but the demon was probably less scary than the blood running out of the chick's eyes. So here is the demon. More like a werewolf really but um yeah it was pleasantly surprising uh like i said i will give it to my daughter to read it's a very floppy um graphic novel it's more like a magazine as well but i enjoyed it so <laughs> the cat's just using the bathroom <laughs> the next book i'm going to read is called monarch and it's like a it's a queer is it mystery i think it's mystery i'll write the right word here but it's not mystery but it's LGBTQIA and I think it's a mystery book. I just love the cover. Picture of a Barbie's face. I was like, interesting, you piqued my interest. Okay, so I just have to give an update on Monarch. I am exactly halfway through, so it's part one and part two. And I had to go and read the blurb for this because this got so crazy. And in the blurb, it does tell you, I didn't read the blurb, of course I didn't, that the main character, former teen beauty pageant person, is actually a sleeper agent that was part of MK Ultra program called Monarch and her parents like work for Deep State. I was like, what is this? This is one of the weirdest books I've ever read. The way it's written and the storyline is so bizarre. I have no idea where this is going. I am just here for the ride. I don't know if I love it or I hate it or I like it. I'm very like not sure yet. It's interesting enough to keep me going. So that is one thing. I've got a kitty on my lap. But wow, this is unlike any other book I have read. Uh, it's full of like pop culture references as well. It talks about modern life stuff. Like she's going through the trial of Lorena Bobbitt. And, um, and it's like, yeah, you're in her life as a teenager, but she's very odd and very weird. And all of this weird stuff is happening. And the way it is written is not a style I've ever read before. I'll try and remember to like, grab some pieces of it so you can see sort of how she writes but yeah strange book but I am interested to see where it goes okay so I just finished reading Monarch hello baby this was the most batshit crazy weird wacky bananas book I have ever read it was so I'm going to read you the blurb from Goodreads to try and help you understand what the book's about, because if I was to describe it, I would struggle. The cryptic worlds of Hana and Stranger Things mingle with the dark humour of Demi in this debut novel about a teen beauty queen who discovers she's been a sleeper agent in a deep state government program and whose love for a fellow pageant girl sparks an underworld journey to the truth of her being. After waking up with a strange taste in her mouth and mysterious bruises, former child beauty queen Jessica Klink unwittingly begins an investigation into a nefarious deep state underworld. Equipped with the eccentric education of her father, Dr. Klink, a professor of boredom studies and the founder of an elite study group on idleness, effect and crime known as the Devil's Workshop, Jessica uncovers a disquieting connection between her former life as a pageant queen and an offshoot of Project MK Ultra, known as Monarch. As Jessica moves closer to the truth, she begins to suspect the involvement of everyone around her, including her own mother, Greta, a beauty queen turned spokesperson for a Norwegian cryo chamber device built to halt the aging process for suburban housewives. With the help of Christine, a black lipstick riot girl, babysitter and confidant, Jessica sets out to take down Project Monarch and the operatives who programmed her. More importantly, she must discover if her first love, fellow teen queen Veronica Marshall, was genuine or yet another deep state plant. Iconic true crime stories of the 90s, Lorena Bobbitt, Nicole Brown Simpson, John Bonet Ramsey, merge with Jessica's own past, triggering traumatic revelations and the radical potential of feminist vengeance. Drawing on theories of human consciousness, folklore, and a perennial cultural fixation with dead girls, Monarch questions the shadow sides of self-concept. Who are you if you don't know yourself? Dude, my friends. <laughs> yes, look, I did enjoy the writing. It 
sometimes I understood what was going on and most of the time I was confused but I was just going along for the ride so what do I rate this it's hard I would say that I'm going to give it three and a half I would have given it more but unfortunately there was some heavy heavy themes in here like pedophilia was touched on and the use of very young girls in this program to do these things made me very uncomfortable I don't like to read about those things I don't like to read about the murder of children which was also in this book so it is heavy it's heavy uh, but the way it is written it is just interspersed with almost like diary like entries 90s pop culture psychology textbook explanations a teenage girl's ramblings it is just bizarre it's bizarre and I I should have like highlighted some examples of what the writing was like but I was too busy reading it so this is very strange it is very like it just reminds me of the 90s and like sort of Mission Impossible and things like that. Um, obviously MK Ultra is an already sort of theme in sci-fi and you might be already familiar with it, but I enjoyed this. It was hard though to have Jessica as a narrator when she was experiencing a real disassociation, um, not knowing what is her personality, what she has done, memory losses. It, it was very weird. It was very weird. There's sapphic um, relationships in this. And overall, look, I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Like I said, if it wasn't for the, some of the darker themes, I would have rated it much higher because it is just so novel. I have not read anything like this. It was a wild ride. Honestly, I, I don't even know what else to say. <laughs> Check it out. I say check it out maybe you'll love it maybe you'll hate it at the very least you'll be like that was different that was unique that was an experience and that's what it was for me so a lot of this too also focuses on teen beauty a child and teen beauty pageants and sort of that culture and that world so it was really fascinating to read um did i like the way it ended yeah i felt like it was satisfactory um it suited the novel so I'm kind of chill with it. I'll just read this one little bit, which I just thought was really cute. Um, so we've got... So this, is, this is about her mother. That day, when the priest ended the homily by telling us that once we accepted the spirit, our bodies would not be shacks, but thrones for the kingdom of heaven, I thought of Greta, who already seemed to me as austere and ancient as a most stunning cathedral. People stopped her on the street to tell her she looked like Gina Davis or Sharon Stone or Michelle Pfeiffer or Claudia Schiffer. They didn't mean she really resembled any of those women. They meant she looked like a star, a light in the act of burning. If religion meant believing Greta's body was a shack, religion was cancelled for me. So I just really enjoyed the writing. Um, I enjoyed reading it. It was like, also like, here's some facts. I don't know if these are real facts. That's the thing I'm hoping they were real. Cause I'm like, did I learn something new today? Or is this made up? I have a feeling they're real facts, but I don't know. But there was a lot of, like I said, 90s, um, pop culture interspersed in there and I just felt like I was back in my teenage girl body living through it I'm like holy shit there was even this one bit with um, about clatter rings and anyone who watched Buffy when they were young all got clatter rings and the, the way you point the heart on the clatter ring meant if you were single if you were taken and it just like the whole it was very nostalgic it was a trip down memory lane for me but with all of this weird shit going on with it as well with all of this like sleeper agent programming and murdering and bizarro stuff so yeah that was fascinating I think this was um queer mystery if I recall I'll write it up if it's not queer mystery but very interesting um I will would be interested to read more of this author's work to see what kind of other stories she writes hello so I'm about to read the invisible kingdom reimagining chronic illness Happy Pride Month too, I forgot to mention that. I am taking care of this little dude today. Hey, sweetheart, little kitten. Um, let's see how this book goes. I just wanted to read out this part where she talks about um, what having chronic fatigue from having chronic illnesses feels like. So I thought it was well done. The feeling erased my will, the sense of identity that drives most of us. The worst part of my fatigue was a loss of an intact sense of self. It wasn't just that I suffered brain fog. It wasn't just a loss of self that sociologists talk about in connection with chronic illness, in which everything you know about yourself disappears and you have to build a different life. Rather, as I got sicker that winter, 
I no longer had the sense that I was a distinct person. On most days, I felt like a mechanism that moved arduously through the world, simply trying to complete its tasks. Sitting upright at my father's birthday dinner at a quiet restaurant required a huge act of will. Normally, absorption in a task, and a mercy flow, can lead you to forget that you feel pain, but my fatigue made such a state impossible. I might, at the nadir of my illness, have been able to write any one of these sentences, but I would not have been able to make paragraphs of them. To be sick in this way is to have the unpleasant feeling that you are impersonating yourself. When you're sick, the act of living is more act than living. Healthy people have the luxury of forgetting that their existence depends on a cascade of precise cellular interactions. Not you. Farewell me, cherished me, now so hazy, so indistinct, Dorday writes, a line I now often thought of. So I'm 40 pages into The Invisible Kingdom, and it really is startling just to see how similar my journey was to the author's journey in navigating chronic illness and just how long it takes just to even get a diagnosis and the absolute rabbit holes you go down trying to figure out what's wrong with me and how can I prevent this happening again. So it's very, very relatable. For me, the hardest part was not being comprehended, or not believed. Physical pain does not simply resist language, but actively destroys it, writes Elaine Scarry in The Body in Pain. To have pain is to have certainty. To hear about pain is to have doubt. The same was true of all my symptoms, none of which could be seen. In those months, I was lonely in a way I never had been before. I could taste the solitude of the human body like brine in my mouth, a taste that never left me. I just think she describes it really fucking well. Hello, so I just finished reading Invisible Kingdom. I've got Sylvia on my lap at the moment. And I really enjoyed it. It is really relatable for me. Someone who has multiple chronic illnesses. I liked the way that she wrote. Her writing was great. I liked the facts that she included. I loved all the quotes that she included. And I found it a really fascinating read um, just to... But yeah, so I, I really enjoyed uh, that novel. So that's why I rated it four and a half stars because like I said it was someone who had similar conditions to me it was just nice to be able to have my own journey validated by reading someone else's who's gone through very similar things and had to fight to be diagnosed and all of the struggles that you face when you have multiple conditions and sometimes feel like you know, you must be imagining everything but uh but you're not so the next book that I'm going to read is The Daughter of the Deep by, I think it's Rick Rawdon. It's a middle grade book. So I've just got one middle grade and then three YAs to read and also Tomorrow and Tomorrow Tomorrow. So those are the final <laughs> books. Um, so I am going over a week this week because I've been very busy with, with the new rescue kitten. She is absolutely lovely. We've called her Blue Sunday, middle name Sunday, so we call it Blue and she is extremely affectionate and chill and playful and an absolute darling. My um, two oldest cats, we've done the scent swap thing. They had no issue with the scent swap. And then I um, did a little meet and greet in the same room. They didn't really go up to her, but they saw her and they just continued on their way. So they seemed to be fine with her. And if it was just those two, I would actually let her out of the house because it wouldn't be an issue. However, my third cat, Sylvie... As soon as she smelled her scent, began hissing and snarling and growling. And then she began hissing and snarling and growling at my other two older cats. So she's become very threatened. So I am still just doing scent swapping with Sylvie and trying to spend as much time with her as possible and sort of reassuring her that, you know, everything's cool. I did have to move her food bowl away from my other older cats. She wouldn't eat near them. But I'm hoping it... Over time, she becomes okay, so I will not introduce her to the kitten until she stops snarling, hissing, or growling at the kitten scent. So we'll see how we go. I'm really hoping it works out. Obviously, we've got a two-week trial. Whenever you rescue uh, a pet, you get a two-week trial to see if it works out. I'm really hoping it does. This will definitely be my last cat. I think four is my absolute max, and no more after that. Um, but we'll see how we go.
Hello. So I just finished reading Tomorrow, Tomorrow and Tomorrow. I have decided to give it three stars. So this book did win the Goodreads Choice Awards for I think Best General Fiction and a lot of YouTubers raving about it. So this story does follow a group of friends who are video game designers and they make video games. Um, my ex-husband and I used to have a gaming console business and so gaming consoles and all the video games associated is something I'm very familiar with and I kind of enjoyed it but I kind of did it just because it was <laughs> it was a big part of my life and it's one of those things where you sort of get sick of a certain thing so I didn't love that aspect but for me this book was mostly centered around the relationships between the characters and that's where it sort of failed for me because I didn't like the relationships between the characters as I felt like their friendships were really unhealthy personally that was just my opinion and so the characters also Sadie and Sam are the two main ones and I did not find them to be very likable people I get that most people are flawed but I don't know in book I kind of need to like someone like Marx was okay the third friend in the group uh, but I just feel like a lot of the things that happened in this novel were just for shock factor and they just felt a bit cheap like these were very heavy things and I just felt like they were put in there for drama so this deals with I can't even tell you a lot of the issues because it might give it away but there are there is murder there is uh, inappropriate relationships between two people with different positions of power there is BDSM, there are miscarriage, there are a lot of, um, there is uh, disability, uh, traumatic events, death, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. And yeah, this book just didn't feel like it was respecting those things. It was just more utilizing them as like tools to create drama and, and move the plot along. Uh, I didn't love the ending either. It's just, it's definitely not what I would call a love story by any means. I think out of all the relationships, my favorites, my favorite was probably with, with Marx and one of his ex-girlfriends, the woman that he had the longest relationship with. Um, but yeah, it wasn't for me. I just, the stuff that kept happening, I was just like, are we really doing this? Are we putting another, you know, dramatic event in? And look, like, I guess it could happen to someone in real life, but these were a lot of things. A lot of things happened. And I don't know. Like I said, I think the biggest thing for me was I didn't like Sam and Sadie's friendship. I felt like both of them were quite nasty to each other and I'm not here for that. Uh, my friendships that I have are very healthy. We have maybe disagreements, but we would never be nasty to each other or call each other names or not speak to each other. It's just, yeah. And it was a big thing too in this book about miscommunication and also just not even saying how you're feeling <laughs> at all. Not even miscommunication, like just completely keeping your feelings under wraps. And I just hate that particular trope. So for me, this book just didn't hit. Um, I only kept reading because so many people liked it and because it won a Goodreads Choice Awards. Otherwise, I probably would have DNF'd it after this thing happens to marks that I was just like, are you serious? Is that what we're doing? Uh, but yeah, so that was Tomorrow, Tomorrow and Tomorrow. The next book I'm reading is Daughter of the Deep by Rick Royden. This is a middle grade book. So the last ones that I have, oh, she's hissing. So Sylvie's in here. This is where I keep blue sunday we just call it blue and at the moment blue has been successfully introduced to two of my cats but as you can hear sylvie is still hissing just at her scent so until she stops hissing at her scent i cannot introduce them so i'm waiting we're still we're doing room swapping so that sylvie can come in here and smell her areas but yeah she's still hissing it's been just two days so i'm still hopeful that it'll be fine we've got two week trial period yes baby We've got a two week trial period with Blue. That's what happens when you get a rescue. And like I said, like at least, hello, hello. The first day when she caught Blue's scent, she was also hissing at everyone, everyone, including my other two cats. So she was very threatened and scared and snarling and growling. But today she's only hissing at Blue's home base. So my room is Blue's home base. Uh, so she stopped hissing at the other cats and at me and, and the kids. So I'm just hoping eventually she'll stop snarling when she comes into Blue's home base. And then a few days after that, I'll try for an introduction when I'm in the room and fingers crossed guys. Um, but this is definitely going to be my last cat. Four is the limit. It's the most I can afford and the most that I feel like I can live with personally. This is not how I plan to do my review, but I have a sleeping kitten in my arms. So I read 
Daughter of the Deep by Rick Riordan. And this was the middle grade book. It's based on um, Jules Verne's, is it 20, the 80,000 Leagues Under the Sea? I'll put the right name here. I can't remember. But that classic book with Captain Nemo and the Nautilus, um, which is a tale I quite enjoy. So this book is for middle grade. I did find in the beginning the, I think she's probably around 14, the protagonist did sound like a 14-year-old girl, but like a cliche 14 year old girl and oh sweetheart isn't she so cute she is the cutest little mm, munchkin um as the book progressed though she did sound a lot more mature this was quite heavy so this gets into it very 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 quickly the action starts immediately with their base <laughs> sorry their base being blown up and a lot of people dying um and all of a sudden she's thrown into this whole thing where she's the finds out she's an important person i don't want to give anything away and um, they must find this relic and all this stuff happens so there is a lot of murder uh which i was not expecting it was okay i to be honest i didn't love it so if i was going to rate it i'd probably rate it a three a three and a half she does have like this dolphin who's like her her dolphin buddy um so that was cool and yeah it was interesting it is very much based on Jules Verne's book so it's in with those themes Mwah. um there are adults involved to trying to murder all these children so yeah it was it was okay another book I read was Death Makes Three this was YA horror I decided to DNF this this was just ridiculous so the protagonists are like 17 and the girl is working at the school's library during the holidays. She's on a scholarship at this school. She gets um, an order in for to pull 147 books for this professor who she doesn't like. And she's really juvenile about it, acting like an idiot, to be honest. Um, she ends up pulling the books for the professor, but she puts sticky notes on top of them like, Professor Blah Blah is an idiot. Professor Blah Blah is a dickwad. Professor, you know, Blah Blah is just all these insults, all these really rude things. And she puts the sticky notes on top of all the books. And I was just like, how are you going to be so dumb? How are you going to be so dumb? I was a librarian. Yeah, it sucks when you have to pull a lot of books for one person, but that's your job. It's kind of like what you do. And if you're not doing that, you're doing another job anyway. So get over it. And if you're a teacher you don't like, like putting sticky notes with all these rude things on top of them, do you think no one's going to see them? Like she was acting like, I don't know, it was just so unprofessional, obviously, but really immature. And then the professor's son ends up, it was for the son, not the, the professor. So his son gets the books and he goes and like talks to her and is like, hey, what's with all the notes? And she's like, oh my God, I was supposed to take them off and they're not for you. It's about your dad. And he's like, yeah, my dad kind of sucks. But I was straight away just not into it, not into it. They were too young and they're trying to act like they're older, but they're not older. And I just the whole startup of like how they meet. So it was just so silly. So yeah, that, that was not for me. I had to DNF it. And then this, she's so distracting. She's so bloody distracting. Hello. Hello, you. Oh, who's the happiest little kitty? You're the happiest little kitty. Hey, Blue. Hey, honey. Oh, that's Sylvie. <laughs> that's my other cat, Sylvie, who's not getting along with Blue. Can't even introduce him yet because she's still hissing at Sylvie's scent, at Blue's scent, sorry. So the next book, sorry once again for these crappy shots, was Echoes and Empires. So this was, I think it's meant to be a fantasy um, YA. And it was so bad once again. So it starts off with this girl and she's the late prime minister's daughter. But everyone sort of felt bad for her that her father died, was killed by this sort of demon magic user, sorcerer. So they let her continue living at the prime minister's house with the new prime minister and his daughter. And supposedly like her and the new prime minister's daughter are best friends. And the queen is also best friends with her. But then she goes to this party and she hears her other friends talking smack about it, like how much they hate her and how they can't imagine that the prime minister's daughter and the queen like her at all. 
and it just felt so stupid and the main character was a bit of an idiot just being in her voice in her head because it's first person was just not for me but she ends up going to this room and she sees she's there's this guard she likes so she goes and hits on this guard and asks him out and he's like nah I'm not interested and then she finds out the queen announces that the prime minister's daughter and this guard are going to get married with an arranged marriage. And I'm like, what? What are the rules of this world? Like, what is this? I thought this was like contemporary. And now you're making matchmaking a prime minister's daughter and a random guard. What? But then the prime minister's daughter is like, I'm so sorry. I should have told you. She was really like dating this dude for four months. And it's just, ah. Oh. And then the other chick's like, oh, I feel like a bit of an idiot. I just asked him out. And he said no. And I guess it's because, you know, he's already dating you. Hey, baby. I love you. Um, so then she goes inside the room and there's a guard in there. And she noticed that all these other guards are like knocked out and he's just stealing something. And she's like, oh, no. And then he, in the kerfuffle, the box falls at her feet and this smoke comes out of it and it gives her magic powers. And anybody that has magic is sort of like considered evil. So she goes on the run with this fake guard dude. And I just decided to DNF it then because everyone just sounded really immature. And yeah, I think that's the thing for me. I don't want them to sound dumb and petty and vain and selfish. So... This wasn't for me. And then the last YA book I read was a YA fantasy sci-fi, I guess you would say, and it's The Blood Trials. This was good. This is not YA, though. So it's why it's classified as YA. But all these characters are, like, I would say at least 18, probably a bit older. There is so much violence. This is heavy, heavy on the violence. And the sex and the drinking and all of that stuff. So it doesn't feel YA to me at all. Um, the main character is great. Uh, I Kenna or Kenna. Uh, she is a, she is experiencing a lot of racism due to her ethnicity in this world. They have a derogatory terms that they call bull in this world. And um, her grandfather was like their war leader uh, and he defeated the blood king or blood mage. I forget what his actual title is. And he was amazing, supposedly, and everyone lauded him as a hero. But then he dies under mysterious circumstances. So Kenna decides to try out for the Praetorian, which is like a special ops group of elite you know, soldiers that she believes one of them has murdered her grandfather. The The issue I have with this book, so overall, I'm going to rate it three and a half. And it would have been higher, but there's this one thing that annoys me. So with this group, the Praetorians, a special ops group, hundreds of people apply. It is, the trials are deadly, as in, if you don't pass, they kill you. For example, it's not always just like they're in this situation where these other like enemies are killing them in the field. No, they made them do 400 burpees. And if you failed to do 400 burpees, they legitimately, like literally, would put a grenade in your back and blow you up. And I'm like, why? If you're about to go to war, wouldn't you want as many soldiers as you can get? Shouldn't it be that if you fail the trials to get into this special ops group that you just have to join the regular army wouldn't that make sense just to be like well sorry you didn't make it so you got to go to the regular army why are you killing them like and they kill them all i'm not even joking they just slaughtered all of them every single one of these trials they were just brutally murdering these possible recruits and i was just like why though like why why would you do that? Why would you kill so many of your highly trained intelligent citizens instead of just saying, well, you didn't make the special ops, so you got to go into the regular army? So that was the biggest, most moronic point in this. Uh, I just couldn't get past. So like I said, lots of killing in this, lots of murdering. People try to kill Kenna many, many times. Kenna's got sort of this special ability and that's kept a secret because people that have abilities like hers are considered the enemy but who is the enemy really is she fighting for the right side it's one of those kinds of books there is a love interest 
didn't do it for me um, at all. I didn't feel anything between them. I was kind of hoping Kenna was bi. I was getting a bit of bi vibes. Oh, this cat. This cat is so adorable. So adorable. Um, but didn't go that way. There were some things that happened, some deaths, some unexpected deaths. So I will give them that. They were just killing off people like nobody's business. No one was safe. Everybody dies in this one. Um, but no, but really, but no. Everyone dies. But I did enjoy it. It was well written. Um, I Would I read more? Probably not. Probably not. Because I didn't love, love it. Like I said, this whole thing, just to get into this special ops thing. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. It was ridiculous, Blue. They were killing everybody. They were killing everyone. Really horribly too. But um, it was definitely the best YA that I read out of all of them. I can see why people would like this series. It's just, I'd, yeah, I just couldn't get over the, this one thing of like, <laughs> why would you try out for this? Besides, if you're absolutely broke and you need the money, I didn't get it. Um, and the whole thing with the war houses was a bit confusing. I'll admit, I didn't quite understand that. So it's quite complex world building and I didn't get all of it, but Kenna was fine as a, as a main character. Um, and no, but yeah, so those were all the books that I read this week. What, what can you smell? What can you smell? Oh my God. <sighs> How did library thing go? Okay. Not as great as I was hoping library thing would go. So I did get some good books. There were a few, but there were quite a lot of duds. Um, but overall, I'm kind of happy with the selection this week and I did have a fun time. And I've been having a fun time with this little one down here too. <laughs> Isn't she adorable? She's so cute. I really hope it works out. I really hope I can get my cat Sylvie to like her. Sylvie, please. If anyone's got tips, I'm just following Jackson Galaxy's method of introduction. And like I said, at the moment, Sylvie is still hissing just at her scent, so. But long road is a long road. She gotta do what you gotta do, man, so. Try my best. But one thing I did learn from this experience was that I do find it fun to try out books that have been recommended. It sort of makes things a bit different. I think I'm going to do a new segment called Who Wrecked It Better? And... I'm going to pit Goodreads against Library Thing and I will read both of their, whatever the first book they recommend for me for a category, for a genre, I'll read both of their first options and I'll see which one wins. So a bit of a battle between Goodreads and Library Thing's recommendations. This time I won't read from every single category. There are just categories that I don't really love, like historical, unless it's historical romance, it's probably not my thing. So I'll stick to the ones that I definitely think are more my, my thing in terms of this recommendation, but I'm just going to choose whatever the first one off the rank is and uh, pit them against each other. So I'm excited to do that. I'm going to make that a monthly thing that I do one week out of the month. Um, so I'll do that next month and we'll see how we go. But I hope that wherever you are, you are having an absolutely amazing morning, afternoon or evening. And as always, stay wild, star child.